Uh, Rex was first licensed in 1960 and focused on uh, 2 meters, 432, and 1296 in the days of AM with 832s and 2C39s. So, hey, a lot of us remember that. He gained Australian records of just 136 miles on 432 and 22 miles on 1296. It's kind of like the millimeter wave uh, bands uh, today. He graduated in communications engineering from the Royal uh, Melbourne Institute of Technology in 1962 and took up employment with the Australian Bureau of Meteorology on the development, testing, and procurement of tele telemetry systems, including radio sons and rocket sons. In 1973, Rex moved to the administrative roles in the head office of the Department of Science in Canberra, and Ham Radio took a back seat. In 1988, Rex was appointed as director of the Australian Antarctic Division in Hobart, Tasmania, responsible for the administration of the Australian Antarctic Territory, including operational support for the Antarctic Program and the management of the Australian Antarctic Science Program. He represented Australia in negotiating the Madrid Protocol to the Antarctic Treaty for the protection of the Antarctic environment. Rex retired in 1999 and returned to his interest in amateur radio and portable operations, starting out on two meters and moving up to uh, uh, 10 and 24 gigahertz, and currently holds the 10 gig world record, uh, on, and also the 10 and 24 gigahertz EME records. And, oh, by the way, I've worked Rex in over 100 grids in Australia and New Zealand, and obviously they're all on moon bounds. So please welcome Rex, VK7MO, who's going to talk about small dish portable EME. Thank you, Al. Uh, this is uh, primarily to tell you that you can do EME with small dishes. and. Uh, this is a, a two foot six dish that I've regularly used across Australia uh, to work many stations, including ELF. <laughs> uh, these grid squares are places where I've worked uh, OK1 KIR and uh, on both 10 gigs and 24 gigs. I like working them because every time they have a contact, they key it into their computer and it's immediately on their website, and you can see where you've been. <laughs> uh, they've worked me at about 120 grid squares. There's a couple of grid squares they've got with other stations in Australia, but other than two, they're all with me. This is a, a typical setup with a, a two foot six dish on 10 gigs. 24 is a lot more difficult, uh, mainly because we can't generate the power, uh, and particularly when you're on the other side of the Earth, you're dealing at low elevations with lots of absor absorption, so need a, a four-foot dish for 24 gigs. The solution to working a small dish EME is to work people who've got a big dish. <laughs> and these are some of the stations who regularly work at me when I'm out portable looking for grid squares. Uh, and we're he doesn't get 650 watts at the feed, by the way. The, the feed line loss is about 3 dB. Here's a, 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 a big station that uh, is always very strong. Now, this is the smallest station I can regularly work when I run a, a, uh, a four-foot dish. So two four-foot dishes will work each other very reliably under all conditions. Now, get into some of the technical things. you notice that as we go up in frequency, the propagation loss increases dramatically. And you start to scratch your head and say, why the hell would I bother going up to 10 gigs to work EME? Cost you another 37 dB over 144. 
And the answer is, for the same gain or same aperture of antenna, every time you go up 10 times in frequency, you, you lose 20 dB in propagation loss, but you gain 20 dB in antenna gain. And fortunately, you've got an antenna at both ends, so you've got another 20 dB. So, in effect, going from 2 metres to 10 gigs, you pick up 37 dB. Now, most of us can't generate the same power at 10 gigs as we can at 2 metres, but you've got a lot of in reserve that allows you to use a much smaller dish. But there's this penalty. You've got to be able to point accurately. System noise is generally much lower at 10 gigs. Uh, absorption becomes a problem at 10 gigs when you're beaming at lower elevations. Uh, and I'm always beaming at low elevations because when you're down under, you work in Europe or North America and the moon's sitting on the horizon. Uh, fortunately, the meteorologists produce these beautiful precipitable water graphs and we can work out it pretty accurately what the attenuation is going to be. Lunar degradation costs you potentially up to 2.3 dB when the moon is as far away as it can be. So if you're doing QRP, choose a time when it's low. You've got to cope with a lot of Doppler shift at 10 gigs. This is a typical situation, plus or minus 30 kilohertz. Uh, more importantly, you have to cope with Doppler spreading. And this is uh, to try and explain why you get Doppler spreading. Effectively, the moon is not a point source. So at this point, the moon's giving you this Doppler, and at this point, that Doppler. This is a, the moon I've made a bit larger, so you can see what it is, not, not the scale. Uh, and potentially, the difference between this and this can be up to 200 hertz of spreading of the signal. And the reality is, using narrow bandwidth modes that are only a few hertz wide, once you spread it 200 hertz, it does cost. Now the moon's doing something like this. This is if you were sitting in the center of the Earth. The reality is we're also rotating. Now if we can find a time when our rotation is such that it directly compensates for the moon's uh, movement, the Doppler spreading can be reduced significantly down to just a few hertz and that's the time when you can do small station EME. This is an example uh, of a JT4 signal when there was 160 hertz spreading you may not even be able to see the four tones there uh, but when it was down at two hertz spreading the four tones show up significantly. So you can sort of see the cost of working at high spreading. Uh, I should say you can still work with that level of signal. In fact, you can work when you can't see anything. It's just I had to have a big station at the other end so there was any chance that you'd see the example. This is an example over a month of what the spreading was like between myself and G3 Whiskey Delta Golf. And you can see just for one day in the month, it got down to a couple of hertz, got up to 120 hertz. The, uh, the other thing you've got to do is you've got to use digital modes if you're going to work <laughs> uh, with small dishes. And on 10 gigs, we use QRA64. Now, a lot of people haven't heard of QRA64. Uh, it has become the standard on 10 gigs. 
It's about 2 dB better than JT65 uh, and JT4. But its big advantage is it's virtually immune to false decodes. Uh, we did a simulation. We simulated some weak signals for about three months. Didn't take three months to simulate it. And we got three false decodes. Uh, and uh, the other advantage of it, it doesn't use a call sign list, which some people regard as cheating. Uh, I don't, by the way, but uh, after all, everyone has a call sign list. They remember their own call sign. And the D submode has become standard on 10 and 24 gigs. E would actually be better, but many SSB receiver passbands are too narrow for the E mode. Although the new 9700 is okay, but I, I think we will all stick to, to the D submode. This is an example of the spreading loss with QRA64D. And if you sort of compare 5 hertz spreading up to 200 hertz, it's about 7 dB difference. Uh, and 70 dB is a big difference on EMV. So if we, we take all these variations, there is a difference between worst case and best case of about 10 dB. And uh, that's an enormous difference on EMV. Here's some options from best to worst case. A two foot six dish to a 10 foot dish. Under the best conditions, you can do it two watts. Worst, 20 watts. Uh, I now run portable a four foot dish. Four foot dish with 60 watts will work another four foot dish under any conditions, with the worst case conditions. Uh, to go even smaller, we've done some tests with small horns. This, this horn here, 7 by 9 inch aperture, so that's equivalent to a very small dish. And, and I'm listening to both HB9Q and G3 Whiskey Delta Golf, and they're sending me little messages, good evening dear Rex, and things like that every second period. Uh, if we go to a smaller dish, a smaller horn, this is a smaller horn. This is only 4 by 5 inch, and that's copying uh, the uh, DL60 SHF beacon. Uh, and the bigger horn is copying it quite consistently. This is missing a few decodes. I have actually copied that beacon on a Yagi. Uh, that's a 72 element Yagi DL6 design on 10 gigs. And, uh, you know, it's still, you're still getting something. Now, I, I went to the little 4 by 5 inch horn only has about a 50% efficiency. It's a, a standard horn design. But by making the horn a bit longer, you can improve the efficiency to about 70%. And I actually had a QSO with Charlie Suckling. He's, he's using uh, a three metre dish. But this is a QSO with Charlie on a four by f uh, five inch horn. Now, at that time, the spreading was only 23 hertz. Lunar degradation was only 0.5 dB. So quite good conditions, but not absolutely as good as you can get. Uh, but that's what I regard as the smallest uh, uh, antenna you can do EME on. Critical factors are accurate watching in all conditions. You must have GPS locking and full Doppler correction. Uh, in general, the stations I work come up with in one and two hertz at 10 gigs, even though the Doppler is over 30 kilohertz. 
You've got a checked system of performance. Uh, sun noise is the way to do that. And probably the most important thing about portable operations, you've got to have a reliability of your equipment and the operators. If you go out doing a whole lot of grid squares and every time you get there you say, sorry, I didn't connect this or this didn't work, people rapidly will lose interest. For pointing, I use this, uh, this system. That is a, uh, a milling machine rotary table and this is a homebrew azimuth control. I, I don't have auto tracking. I find that uh, as soon as you introduce more uh, electrical systems to it, it's more unreliability and the reality is with digital modes, you can have the thing set up there, you just look at the computer and you can adjust it by hand. If the moon's visible, it's easy, you just correct that way. Uh, alignment, I, uh, I use a rifle scope behind the dish. Uh, initially you have to li align it up on the sun and obviously you don't look at the sun through a rifle scope so you use a little welding slide like that. Number 13 is about right. So I just clip that with a close peg behind the, the rifle scope and then when I go over to the moon I remove that. You need an azimuth reference and if you're going portable you're always looking for some azimuth reference. Uh, if I'm if I can see the moon, well, I can just point the rifle scope at the moon, and, and that's terrific. If I can't see the moon because of cloud, I can use the sun. If the sun's not up, I can put a GPS, handheld GPS out. If you put it out, say, uh, 500 meters, uh, and you can calculate a bearing with reasonable accuracy. If I'm at home, I live in Hobart, Fortunately, there is a bridge with the navigation light on it there, which is exactly 35 degrees, and that works pretty well. But the new system we've been using, which is, has just come out in Dubus and is also in your uh, proceedings, uses differential GPS. So what you do is you've got the one GPS antenna right on your antenna, you just put a tripod out, and we get an accuracy of an RMS accuracy of, of better than 0.1 of a degree on five metre baseline. If you can run at a, a longer baseline, you can do even better. For elevation, I, I use a mechanical inclinometer. Uh, the reason is if you use a, a digital inc uh, inclinometer, usually the sun shines on it, you can't read it. The battery goes flat. Nice mechanical one always works. And at night, all you do is shine a torch on it. You'll notice I have two inclinometers, one for vertical and one for horizontal polarization, where I flip the dish. Uh, I can also mount the thing at 45 degrees, but then my inclinometers don't work. But if I can track the moon, that just a, a, a series of brackets. One of the problems we have in VK is we have to use horizontal polarization for North America and vertical polarization to Europe. Uh, my policy is I always use horizontal, that's easier for me. And if people want to work my grid square, they can sort it out for themselves. <laughs> uh, this is sun noise on a uh, two foot six inch dish. Uh, actually it's not. It's on a two foot dish. Uh, so about 3.9 dB. You can just about, de those white lines are when the moon's there, you can just about detect moon noise on a, on a two foot dish. Uh, if you scale it up on spectra view, moon noise is there, but it's only, you know, 0.1 dB. Well, it, in, it's, it's good to 
check system performance on moon noise. In practice, you can only find moon noise if you know where it is. So it's, it's no good uh, on a small dish relying on tracking on moon noise. For the 24 gig uh, world record, I used the four foot dish and worked Charlie in uh, the UK with his uh, three meter dish. You'll notice he's got a little horn. That was when we were experimenting with horns. The, the problem at that time is I only had 10 watts with the DV6NTPA. And to make it work, I had to had all this absorption because of the, the distance and the low elevations. Uh, to make it work, I went to the highest mountain I could. Uh, you guys are always at a higher mountain, I have discovered since I've been here. <laughs> but uh, at about 1,270 metres, what this blue line shows you is the reduction in water vapour with height, and that represents uh, about 2 dB improvement, which was necessary to complete that world record. This is a, a comparison of the loss uh, at Charlie's end and my end as elevation changed. And the reason why it doesn't duplicate is the person who's got the highest loss at their end has also got higher uh, absorption noise on receive, uh, and that swaps over obviously. To extend the world record, I had to go from my location here, and I went as far as I could get in Australia from Charlie. Uh, I couldn't get up as high, so I had to phase up a pair of DB6 NT 10 watt PAs uh, with magic T's for 20 watts, that gave me another 60 kilometres. For 10 gigs, uh, I was out portable uh, in, in this area of Australia and working Jim. Some of you might know that Jim unfortunately passed away not long after this contact, but uh, he said to me he was going to go to Delaware and I thought, Gee, we've got a chance of doing the world record <laughs> if you're going to Delaware. Uh, and I, I was up here at the time, but I was prepared to drive down here. Uh, we, we were both looking for the best takeoff we could, and it's very hard to beam over water from the east coast of the USA or the west coast of Australia, but there is just one spot here where you get a fairly good water takeoff. And he was out on a sandbar and he got some water takeoff. I think his takeoff's about a half a degree. That's my system at a place called Meal Up. Now, it turns out Meal Up is an Aboriginal word for place of the rising moon. <laughs> That's the only place in Western Australia where they can see the moon rising over the water. And this is Jim's takeoff. You can see there are some trees in the distance. Uh, he, he built a beautiful system. I mean, it's such a shame he's not around. Uh, 2.4 metre dish. Uh, this is what his system looks like in his vehicle. Uh, this is not so elegant in the back of mine. <laughs> Jim and I were planning to extend the world record and he was prepared to go to Bermuda. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away before that was possible. And I, oh, here, here's the decodes. Uh, I should say we calculated the time of the common window at 52 minutes, and we actually had copy, good copy for 51 minutes. Uh, there was a gap in the middle when I worked Al, <laughs> uh, so he got the grid square as well. 
To extend the world record, I had to go to, I, I couldn't go any further from anywhere in, in Australia. Uh, and I talked to Charlie, three, G3 Whiskey Delta Golf, about going to New Zealand. Now, there were two options. We could work from this side of New Zealand that way, or this side of New Zealand that way. This would have been 19,807 kilometres, and this is only 90, a little bit less. Uh, we had to think whether this was going to even work. I mean, the, the longest you're ever going to get around the world is about 20,000 kilometres. So we started some looking at uh, dishes that I could take to New Zealand. The New Zealanders didn't have, I, I sort of put out a message that I'd like a dish. The New Zealanders, uh, where, how am I going for time? Can someone tell me? Right. Uh, when were we supposed to go to the break? Yeah, what time were we supposed to go? 2.15, so I better go pretty be quick. Okay, I, I tried to get, I looked up the web and there's this beautiful dish available. Uh, oh, okay, so we've got plenty of time. We've got plenty of time. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, anyway, I sent them an email for a quote and they didn't bother replying. Uh, I then sent them another email, said I'm a ham, I'm really interested in doing this. They still didn't reply. I got a friend who had a communications company to send them a letter, an email. They came back straight away. Yes, we'd love to supply you. Uh, there'll be a minimum quantity of 10. They're $16,000 US each. <laughs> uh, so that wasn't an option. But it'd be a beautiful dish if you could get it. The solution was to cut up a, a, an aluminium dish which we were able to get for zero cost. So I cut it up into segments. And that all fits into uh, my luggage. Uh, This is my cabin bag. See, I wanted to carry the preamp and the amplifier with me. You try getting that for security. <laughs> <laughs> now, the problem is, once you start getting near the limit, obviously, if you're at the opposite sides of the Earth, you're beaming through the Earth. So you're never going to get the, the total 20,000 kilometres. The other problem is, once you start, you can, you can improve things by going up to high mountains. Unfortunately, it doesn't improve it as much as you'd think because there's a square uh, root relationship between height. But it helps to go up a high mountain, gives you a bit more time. But what happens is, if you, if you were there, you could only see the moon to the horizon, and you go through that much atmosphere. When you go up to a high mountain, you can see it further down, but you're now going through twice as much atmosphere. And the absorption at 10 gigs is a key factor. So we did some tests in Tasmania with Charlie to look at the effects of absorption, what we might say is typical absorption. And you can see, once you get down to about 10 degrees, it doesn't make much difference. But by the time you hit zero degrees, it's costing you about 5 dB. You can actually, we actually got decodes right down to uh, one degree below the horizon, which you can get because you get about 0.7 of a degree atmospheric refraction. And if you've got a bit of height, that'll get you down to minus one degree. But the atmospheric absorption is now costing you about 9 dB. Uh, the other thing is polarization. We did a test to look at what the, because you're being very low, you're effectively getting ground noise. And 
the interesting thing is if you get if you beam over the C, the C reflects, so you don't get the noise. And but if you, you've got to pick the right polarization. Now you can see the ground noise with horizontal polarization peaks at zero elevation and drops off, whereas with horizontal polarization, uh, with vertical, it keeps rising. So there's about 2 dB to be gained by using horizontal polarization over the sea. This was uh, my location in New Zealand, right over the sea, as you can tell. And you can see the, the tape that holds the dish together after we reassembled it. Uh, G3 Whiskey Delta Gold went to a place called Start Point. And uh, that was the decodes at my end. And by the time the moon had got to minus one degree, he was sending a 73 single tone, which is very clear with the integrated uh, single tone technique that's available on QRA 64. You can hardly see it, but it is, it is there as well. And uh, that's the, the team in ZL, including myself, congratulating ourselves. Thank you. And questions? <laughs>